Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Buffalo Bills Center of the West. I am Mary Robinson, director of the McCracken Research Library here at the center. On behalf of the library staff and the library board of advisors, I welcome you to this special presentation. The library reading room and facility is located down the hallway from here. Like the five museums, we offer exhibits and important collections for research. The McCracken Library is part of the center's effort to support original scholarship on the American West, and like the other museums, we host lectures from time to time here in the co-auditorium. Next month, on September 17th, the library will host Timothy Egan for a lecture followed by a book signing. Egan is the author of many popular and award-winning books, among them a recent biography of the photographer Edward S. Curtis called Short Nights of the Shadow Catcher. I hope that you will mark your calendars for this special opportunity to listen to a fine speaker and National Book Award winner. Sharing insights with us today is Dr. Ross Eman, a professor of journalism and communications at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Dr. Eman has conducted research on Yellowstone in the McCracken archives, where I met him about one year ago. At that time, we discussed the possibility of his returning here to deliver a lecture on presidential speeches in the park, and we're delighted to have him back. A final word to those of you in the audience who are part of the tour. If you need to leave before the lecture is over, please do so as necessary. We understand and we're used to this. Also, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or silence it at this time. That includes myself. <laughs> Without further ado, Dr. Ross Eman. Thank you, Mary, for your kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I feel like many of these, since my wife has been calling them for the last six months, my five guys uh, <laughs> who came some 2,000 miles, at least, from the East Coast to, to visit Yellowstone and give speeches about their, their experience. And uh, I've come not quite as far as they've come, but I uh, feel like I'm part of that, that group. So I'm going to talk about uh, the experience they had and the speeches that they delivered while they were here. And uh, as, as Mary explained, I think this provides a little snapshot both into the history of Yellowstone National Park and also the history of the United States as a whole. So uh, we'll begin by um, taking a look at who actually has come to Yellowstone in a presidential capacity. Um, basically, 10 American presidents, by my count at least, have visited Yellowstone. Many came just to have a vacation uh, with one or more family members, but five of them came in essentially a presidential capacity, and uh, they gave a speech to mark that occasion. And it's these speeches that I'm primarily interested in at this point in terms of, of well, what did they say about Yellowstone and what was its significance? Uh, this is the right way. The first American president to, to visit Yellowstone was Chester Arthur back in 1883. That was 11 years after Yellowstone had been created as the world's first national park. It was in considerable difficulty uh, due to poachers and vandalism and so on. So an expedition was mounted, uh, which Arthur was part of, to come and, and study the situation and see what might be done. There has been a, uh, a book on on this uh, expedition uh, by Robert Hartley and uh, looking through the book to see whether Arthur had given a speech, I couldn't find any record of one, but I decided, well, I might as well make sure, so I sent him an email and uh, he was kind enough to, to respond and confirm that in fact Arthur did not uh, give a speech or in fact say anything very much at all about his visit to, to Yellowstone. Uh, to Hartley's surprise, uh, it was actually General Sheridan who uh, had the most to say. But he wasn't president, so he doesn't enter into my <laughs> 20 years later, Theodore Roosevelt uh, visited Yellowstone. We're going to hear more about him later. 
Uh, he loved to give speeches. I don't think anyone liked to give speeches more than Theodore Roosevelt. So not surprisingly, he gave one while he was in Yellowstone. The next president to visit Yellowstone and also give a speech was Warren G. Harding in 1923. He was on his way to Alaska. He never made it. For those of you who may recall that he, he died shortly after visiting Yellowstone. Um, Hopefully it had nothing to do with the visit to the park uh, in that case. He uh, visited the usual sites. Uh, we'll see many of these familiar scenes with President Stanley viewing the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, and of course in Harding's case, uh, feeding bears and so forth. Uh, in his party was a future American president, uh, but he doesn't really count, but he was uh, in his capacity. Uh, Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover uh, and become the next president, but the president thereafter. Calvin Coolidge uh, came to the to Yellowstone uh, a few years later, and uh, actually not with too much encouragement from the superintendent of the park. It was a rainy season. Coolidge was over in Custer State Park and kept asking, could he come to Yellowstone? Uh, but the superintendent said, well, Hunting, fishing is not very good. Maybe you should just stay in Custer. But he came in in any event, and uh, came at a time when a uh, rather unusual uh, event was taking place. Uh, a little bit further along, you can see on the right is uh, is is the president. He seems rather deep in thought, and that's because the photograph of the two men in the right-hand corner, Sacco and Manzetti, this was the time when they were to be executed, and uh, the president had uh, decided against uh, giving them a reprieve from that. So the execution occurred while he was in Yellowstone, and so he was quite heavily guarded uh, during that, that trip. We'll skip over some of the details of that. Uh, but the next president to, to come to Yellowstone was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and uh, he did not give a full-fledged speech, but he made some very interesting comments on, uh, on, on his departure that we'll come back to. He made a very sort of insightful prediction of what was coming for Yellowstone down the road. So we'll get to that a little bit later. The next president to visit the park was uh, Gerald Ford. He made a very significant speech that we'll get to. Uh, Jimmy Carter came. He was down in the Tetons. Uh, he didn't give a speech. He mainly came for, for pleasure. You can see from uh, his itinerary uh, that he gave a photo opportunity at one point, but no, no speech per se. The next president to come was George Herbert Walker Bush. He came in by, obviously, by helicopter, um, but not in a presidential capacity, really, to the point where he delivered a speech. Um, Bill Clinton, however, when he came in 1995, initially for a family vacation with his wife and daughter Chelsea, who invited along a friend, uh, he gave both a speech and a radio address at the end of his visit. Uh, and one of quite significance, and it, it led him to come back a year later and give a further speech, making a fairly significant announcement that we'll come to. Uh, the final uh, visit came fairly recently by President Obama, uh, but he didn't give a speech. So let's go through then the five who did, and see if we can put these into some kind of context. And uh, just by way of a teaser, really, one of these speeches will make an announcement uh, to the effect that 1.5 billion dollars, which was at the time a large sum of money, would be set aside to double the size of the national park system in the United States over a period of 10 years. Another one of these speeches uh, celebrated the suspension of a very harmful mining project on the north uh, east corner of the park, and uh, that saved the park from a great deal of uh, probable pollution that would have resulted from that. Yet another speech uh, anticipated problems that led to the famous program known as Mission 66, which affected all the parks, including Yellowstone. And yet another one of these speeches 
help to restore a long-standing myth about the important connection between the frontier in America and American democracy. So these are the kinds of things generally that went on in these speeches, and so I think it makes them worth looking at uh, a little more closely. So let's begin with Theodore Roosevelt. He came in 1903, and it was part of a 14,000 mile tour that he made to some two dozen American states. And he uh, came on a car known as the Elysian. Everything was beautifully equipped. There were reporters, there were photographers, and so forth. And uh, he gave a lot of speeches along the way, usually from the, the rear of the train. He gave uh, some 700 or some 263 speeches. Uh, you do the math, it's about seven or eight a day. Uh, and one of these was a Yellowstone speech, and it was probably one of the more important of these. He received various gifts along the way. For example, in Butte, Montana, they gave him a foot high cup. It could hold 16 pints of beer, apparently. <laughs> Whether it had the beer in it, I'm not sure. I'm still researching that part of it. <laughs> he had prepared some of his speeches in advance, and they tended to deal with fairly serious matters, such as uh, the trust, the Monroe Doctrine, and so forth. But gradually, his speeches underwent change. And the change occurred in part, I think, because of his experience in, in Yellowstone and also in Yosemite. He used the trip to test out the slogan, his slogan, the square deal, as sort of the epitome of his political philosophy. Uh, he heard probably of the, the New Deal and also the Fair Deal for Roosevelt, it was the square deal. And uh, he used this in speech after speech, and it had a lot of resonance with those who heard those speeches, and so he used it in the uh, subsequent campaign. As I mentioned, he later went to Yosemite and uh, was quite influential in terms of turning his emphasis more towards conservation and the environment. But it was mainly when he came to, uh, by train to Gardner and then told the, the reporters to, to stay put while he and a small party went into the park for about two weeks. And this was in April, any of you who know uh, Yellowstone and the climate of this area will know that that was fairly strenuous camping. You can see from uh, one of these pictures, if you look closely, uh, there is snow in the background. So he's camping, it's not the middle of the Yellowstone winter, but it's still a pretty rugged experience for him. And he relished that. And uh, that was exactly the kind of thing he came to do. He found time uh, to write a little postcard to his five-year-old son, which I find quite delightful, and I'm going to just read it to you if you don't mind. Uh, his little son, his nickname was Quenty Quee. His real name was Quentin, but he called him Quenty Quee. He said, I love you very much. Here's a picture of the mule. He drew a little picture of the mule for his five-year-old son. Here's a picture of the mule that carries, among other things, my bag of clothes. There are about 20 mules in the pack train. They follow one another uh, in a single file up and down the mountain paths and across the streams, your loving father, etc. So he found time to, to write even to his son while on this, this trip. And then as he was leaving in Gardner, Montana, he gave the speech that dedicated what became known as the Roosevelt Arch, uh, kind of a monument marking the north entrance to the park. Uh, a lot's been written about that, but it, uh, it's not quite finished when he gives the speech, but there's a large crowd there, and it was a big day for Gardner, Montana, when he delivered that speech. I'm interested in someone in the contents of the speech, and like many politicians and presidents, one of the favorite themes is to emphasize the democratic nature of national parks, and in particular Yellowstone, the idea that these parks belong to all of the people. So he began his speech with, with this theme in mind, emphasizing that, that Yellowstone is the property of every American citizen. He then went on to talk, uh, not surprisingly, uh, about the means of getting around the park, which at this point were quite primitive. Uh, you can see from some of the other photos, it was not easy, though, for people 
uh, even if the park belonged to them, to actually come and visit it and, and get around at the time. And so he suggested that uh, we become even more democratic when the, uh, the means of conveyance were improved. And we'll see if by the time Harding gets there 20 years later, uh, a lot has changed in terms of transportation. He, as probably the uh, most conservationist of all presidents in the modern era, he naturally spoke about conservation, not only of wildlife, but the role of uh, forests and, and water and so forth. Uh, there are quotes about that. But what I'm particularly interested in is the, uh, the statement that he made at one point where he said, the people will be able to ensure to themselves and their children and to their children's children much of the old time pleasures of the hardy life of the wilderness and of the hunter in the wilderness. He talked about coming to the West as kind of a liberal education, but this was, this was the, the point that, that really would epitomize, I think, Roosevelt's view of the significance of Yellowstone. And to put this into context, uh, we need to talk about two other things very briefly. The first of these is what's known as the Turner Thesis, which was a, a thesis put forward in 1893 in a famous essay called The Significance of the Frontier in American History, where Turner had argued that American democracy had been facilitated to a large extent by the presence of this large area of open, free land. It, it cultivated independence in American citizens, and as long as there was this expanding frontier, a continuous frontier, American democracy uh, would remain healthy. But he also announced at the same time that the frontier uh, had closed, it had come to an end, that this era of free land was over. And uh, Roosevelt, who had written himself a history of the West, was well aware of the Turner thesis, but he understood the role of the frontier a little differently. For him, it was not so much free land, but but being able to engage in a hardy life on the frontier that would continually reinvigorate American citizens. And this was reinforced by a psychological theory of the time, which used the strange term uh, neurasthenia to describe what was thought, and this is over a century ago, as, as kind of a disease of high civilization, whereby too much civilization was really bad for people, and they needed to, to get out into the wilderness to kind of restore their values. And so I think what Roosevelt did of most significance in the speech he gave was that he found a way of preserving the frontier in a place like Yellowstone. Yellowstone now, because it belongs to the people, because it's there now forever, it becomes kind of a permanent frontier, but especially in his sense, where you can get away from uh, civilized daily life and, and go into the wilderness and encounter nature and so on in an invigorating way. So this was kind of his answer to the closing of the frontier, that, that the national park, Yellowstone in particular then, would enable this frontier to, to remain a vital part of American history. We get a very different take on uh, on the importance of the park and, and uh, the significance he sees in it by Warren G. Harding, who came then 20 years later. Uh, as you can see from this photo, he's driving in a nice convertible. That's the way he's going to see the park. No mule train for him. And uh, he's, uh, he's welcomed by the, the local uh, establishments in Livingston and so on, and they're very happy to have another presidential visit coming their way. Uh, what, one of the things that's really changed here, and this is a huge other history I won't go into, but you can see on the left, that's the way that uh, people would have traveled through the park in 1910, but by 1916, they're now bringing their automobiles into the park, and if they can't do that, then they'd be traveling by, by buses organized uh, by Yellowstone in order to do that. So we see Hardy then traveling around by car, going to the, uh, all the normal sites, uh, feeding the bears, and so forth. And uh, as he was leaving, he, uh, before he boarded his train, he gave a speech in Livingston. And I'd like to try and put this into a little bit of context by talking very quickly about a, one of the books that's been written about Yellowstone by Judith Meyer, 
called the Spirit of Yellowstone. And she basically tried to analyze a, about a century of, of writing about Yellowstone. Not only books, but articles and poems and, and reminiscences and a, a huge volume of material. I tried to break this down into sort of the major themes. The one thing she didn't look at, actually, though, were speeches, uh, especially presidential speeches. And so it would be interesting to see uh, the extent to which her analysis fits with the speeches that, that I'm considering. But she found then the six most prominent themes were the, the beauty of the landscape. That was the, the clear one uh, that was emphasized the most. But the uniqueness of Yellowstone, its role in terms of tourism, its democratic nature, and so forth. These were other themes that she found to be quite, quite prominent. She broke down, and this is her chart, uh, broke down the, the beauty genre, if you like, which she found to be fairly continuous. It's the top purple line. But she found it was comprised of different elements. And, and some of these had changed over time. In particular, those who referred to religion, the, the reddish line there, that tended to be on the decline. People, when they talked about the beauty of Yellowstone, did not really invoke religion as much as, as time went on, as we got into the 20s and the 30s and so forth. So that kind of declined and other aspects became more important. Why is this important? Well, when we find, we look at 1923, when Harding comes to visit the park, first of all, uh, there is a, H.B. Blair Motor Company is going to welcome him, and they use religious language in talking about the park, so it's still evident in uh, places like that. Uh, you will leave, they say, this land of action and scenic grandeur, more impressed with the handiwork of the creator. So there is still this religious theme that's at work, and Harding himself then uh, uses it in his own speech. He delivers his speech on a Sunday, and uh, we have a couple of quotes up here, which I won't uh, read in their entirety, but he says, there's nothing more helpful, nothing that gives one a greater realization in the wonders of creation than a visit to that great national institution by which he, of course, means Yellowstone. So the religious theme for him is still quite important. Uh, he gives, though, a, a very touching little anecdote describing uh, an incident that occurred while he was being driven throughout the park. And I think he, he uses this as kind of an indirect, bleak way of kind of reinforcing his, partly his domestic policy, but I think more his foreign policy, the approach that he took in terms of things like the League of Nations. He doesn't talk about this directly, but his underlying philosophy, I think, is expressed uh, in this little anecdote. And it's a story about how they're coming down a steep grade and the mother grouse and her little chicks start going across the road in front of them and Harding's driver uh, manages to slam on the brakes and come to a halt. And Harding is very, as you can see if you can read this in part, he's very impressed with this. He thinks he, he really uh, is grateful to the driver for doing that and praises him for doing that. And, and then goes on to talk a little bit about how uh, it's an example that we should follow more generally. Because here was a case where someone didn't have to, to make that effort on behalf of, of these weaker creatures. And so he tries to, I think, explain that this is, in terms of foreign policy and so on, the, the stronger nations have a role to protect the weaker nations. And this is one of the reasons why he didn't like the League of Nations. He thought it was a gang of of powerful states, and they weren't really out to uh, to protect the weaker nations, and he saw a different role for the United States. He doesn't put it into those terms. This is a, you know, a speech, a friendly speech on a, a trip after Yellowstone, but I think he's indirectly, that's the message he's conveying through this little anecdote, and presidents then often would, would do that in their talks. Uh, Goes on a little bit further about the security and human relations. I think we'll, we'll move on. So I'm make sure we get all five presidents having a chance to have their say here. And uh, the next person to come is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Did he give a speech about Yellowstone or in Yellowstone? Well, he, 
visited another national park a few years earlier, Glacier National Park in 1934, and he referred to Yellowstone <coughs> in that address. And uh, one of the interesting things here is that for those of you who've read about the park's history, we'll probably know about the what is now usually referred to as the myth about its creation, how on, a, uh, on one of those expeditions, men sitting around a campfire came to the conclusion that really something should be done to preserve this area for all Americans in the future. And, and this, this sort of selfless idea of creating a national park was born that night around the campfire. Some truth in that, but like most myths, it, it contained elements of exaggeration. Uh, it, it's a myth because it reconciles a seeming contradiction. And the contradiction was that in this era of, of increased commercial exploitation, how did a national park ever get created? And the myth kind of answers that, it resolves that tension or contradiction, but it oversimplifies it. And uh, the interesting thing is here is that Roosevelt's speech writers just incorporate the myth quite directly into the talk. Uh, they're not worried too much about the larger history. But again, it's, it's an important myth, and it's not, a, the myth in this case is not something that's false. It's just that it, it's using the truth in, in a way to resolve certain contradictions. Okay, a few years later, however, Roosevelt himself did come to Yellowstone for a brief visit, and uh, we've got his itinerary at the top. He came on September 25th and stayed another day, September 26th, uh, and visited Old Faithful, the Grand Canyon, and so forth. And upon leaving, uh, he made, uh, these are quoted as extemporaneous remarks. It wasn't a full-fledged speech. But these are very interesting remarks because he uh, tells his audience as he's getting ready to board the train that the superintendent had given him some figures about park attendance. And uh, the figures show that in uh, 1929, some 260,000 people had visited the park, but in the year that he was there, some 500,000 people visited the park. And then he said, quote, our chief problem in the future will be taking care of people. Seems a rather innocuous comment, but it's actually very perceptive. And we can see how perceptive it is by looking at a chart that was prepared by park officials some years later. I love this document because I discovered it here in the McCracken Research Library. This, they have the original. I've never seen it anywhere else, so give them credit for having this document. Uh, what it shows is that we've got two lines here. One, one is projection of the, the actual visitors to the park, and then the bottom red line is the, the staff they're going to have that they're going to have to deal with these. And so we see in, the, in my little circle there that the two are growing apart during the period that, that Franklin Roosevelt is visiting. He's seen that the, the staff is more or less constant, but the number of visitors is increasing quite dramatically. That problem disappears because of the Second World War. It disappears temporarily. So the numbers come close together uh, once again. But immediately after the war, then the same situation develops once again, and it increases. Uh, it's even much greater uh, gap between the two as you move into the, the 1950s. So the, the number of visitors is skyrocketing, and there, there really is a major concern then about how to manage all of these people. And programs like Mission 66 and so forth are part of the answer, but it becomes an ongoing kind of consideration. So that speech was kind of significant in seeing that, that would be a, a future problem for parks. Well, a long time passed before another president returned to Yellowstone. I'm not quite sure why this was the case. It seems as if perhaps presidents come in hard times rather than good times. It's the period of the Cold War. Uh, it's not just the Second World War, the Cold War. I think presidents were preoccupied with other things. But in 1976, at least, Gerald Ford uh, does return. There is a, a typo on some of the publicity materials for this talk where it says 1978. I am entirely to blame for that. Uh, it's not 1978, it's 1976. So this is, if you're saying, which is the real date, this is the real date. Uh, Ford had a luncheon at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone with the former chief ranger. Uh, he then went on and gave a talk at uh, 
an old faithful, and uh, he actually timed his talk so that uh, in the middle of the talk, old faithful would go off. Uh, I've been trying to figure out what I could do in the middle of this talk to kind of match that, <laughs> but nothing's come to mind. If anyone has an idea or two, I welcome it. Uh, so he you know, compliments the park staff for being so efficient in getting old faithful to erupt on, on time. The only, the only thing that I can claim to fame in this regard is that the last two years that I've gone to old faithful with my family, I managed to, to pull up to Old Faithful about two minutes before it went off each time, and we didn't have to wait three more hours for the next next eruption. Okay, th this is probably we're not really going to expect too much from Ford in terms of Yellowstone. Uh, he's somewhat of an environmentalist, but he's primarily concerned with the American economy at this time, and we'll see why on this next slide. Uh, if you look to the left. We, in the blue circle. This is this is the what's happening to inflation during the Ford presidency. So when he comes into office, inflation has risen up to 12 percent. Imagine having a mortgage of 12 percent. In fact, mortgages in Canada at that time they were 20 percent of your mortgage. This was a major problem, and it's complicated, of course, by a lot of other things that are happening. What he achieves by focusing on the economy is to wrestle that down to just over 4 percent. So it's not surprising that he was focusing on the economy, and in retrospect, hard to criticize him for doing that. But you wouldn't expect that he's going to be too concerned about national parks or Yellowstone in particular. Except that he had once been a park ranger. 40 years earlier, he had, had been a park ranger, or 30 years earlier, uh, in 1936. Uh, I've got a wonderful collection. He's the third from the left in, in this photo, if you are wondering which one's for Get a bonus point if you can move. And uh, if you want to hear, read a little bit about his experiences in his own autobiography, he recounted some of those. Um, he was the one who had to get on a flatbed truck with a shotgun and make sure no one got hurt while they were feeding bears. Uh, something that went on in his time as a park ranger, but of course no longer occurs. And, uh, hasn't occurred for a very long time. You can see the difference uh, in these two photos of what used to occur in the park. Uh, we have the bear feeding from the 1930s. Even in the 1950s, people feeding bears from their cars and so on. A very, very dangerous situation. There were a lot of injuries that resulted from that. But he's a park ranger, and he comes back to Yellowstone, and he is told a man by the name of Ansel Adams that he says, if anyone has a basic feeling for parks, uh, I have. So he's going to do something a little more significant. Who is this man, Ansel Adams? Well, Ansel Adams is a very famous nature photographer. Uh, he made the cover of Time magazine in 1979. We have his photo of Old Faithful way back in 1941. Uh, and he had. Uh, Produced a, a beautiful, we'll jump ahead here and then jump back, uh, a beautiful book of his photographs, including one called Clearing Winter Storm. And this was a favorite photograph of the Fords. And they asked him if they could have a copy of this photograph and, and of the book and so on. And so they invited him to the, to the White House. So we see in the earlier slide here, uh, there he is visiting uh, the president and his wife. We have the White House photographer on the, the right, and I think that's Ansel Adams' agent uh, to the right, Bill Turnage. And so he comes to the White House, and uh, let's just jump a little bit through this. He decides, uh, we've got an explanation of how he can go, but he basically decides that he's not going to let this opportunity pass, to pass him by, because he's he is an environmentalist generally, and he's very concerned about the state of the national parks. So he uses the opportunity, uh, to, when he's visiting the White House, to prepare a memorandum and, and, and give it to the president while he's there. And we'll just quote the last part, because it's quite uh, significant. He says, this generation may have the last chance to save essential lands for future generations. It's his feeling that time is running out to find 
areas where preservation can still take place, where commercialization, industrialization hasn't more or less eliminated the possibility for any uh, heritage preservation to, to actually occur. And this is what he's trying to impress on the president during this particular visit. Um, it's not entirely clear sort of how much stock the president put into uh, that visit or that memorandum, but his daughter, Susan Ford, went off to study photography uh, the next uh, summer or so with Ansel Adams. And uh, I suspect that she sort of may have absorbed some of his environmental concerns and brought them back to the White House, possibly. Uh, I'm exploring this and talking to uh, some of the people who were, were with her there. And uh, one of the people in that room, uh, Alan Ross, uh, I emailed him and asked him about this. And uh, he sent me back some wonderful photographs and explained uh, how they had, what had gone on while Susan was there studying photography with Ansel Adams. And this was a shot they took. Uh, she, of course, also had to have security around her. So they took this picture of her with the, her escorts, her security uh, people, while she was there. Um, but I suspect that uh, you've got a process here of, of sort of indirect influence taking place. And Adams himself had one more chance to influence the president uh, when he met him at a, a golf course uh, not too long thereafter, and, and uh, probably again tried to reinforce his view that something needed to be done for the environment. So we come now to the to the speech that Ford deliver, delivers at Yellowstone, and uh, it starts pretty much like most of these speeches, with the usual pieties and so on being uttered. Uh, you know, we've got to cherish the wildlife and so forth, uh, but nothing very specific until suddenly at the end of the speech, he says, well, this is the bicentennial. This is 1976. How I couldn't put 1978 in. 1976 is the bicentennial. We should give ourselves a birthday present as Americans. What could that be? Well, let's set aside $1.5 billion over the next 10 years and double the size of the national parks. That's an astounding pronouncement. And I think that that Adams and others then kind of influenced him in this direction to make this, this claim, but more research needs to be, to be done on this. What happened? Did this come about? Well, if we look at the actual record in terms of acreage created uh, under different presidencies, we find that under Lyndon Johnson, 9.9 .9 million acres of, of new land was set aside to, for preservation. Only 3.1 million under Ford, and then under Jimmy Carter, some 60 million acres were set aside. So it was uh, Carter who defeated Ford, uh, who did create a lot of this, but there's a more to the story here, and I'll just bring it up very quickly with, with this final chart. If you look at these, we've got, it's the green and the gray we need to worry about. The green, those are national parks, and so if you look from 19, 80 to 1990, you see that the, the total acreage of national parks in the United States does in fact more than double. So this did come about, but did it come about through Gerald Ford? Well, not exactly. What happened was that under Carter, we get a huge increase in the gray area. Well, the gray area are things like national monuments that the president can create through his own signatory power. He doesn't need congressional approval to do this. So he doesn't really, there's no real expansion of national parks under, under Carter, but he greatly increases the, the acreage of these national monuments. And then if you go through to 1990, you see suddenly the gray has shrunk and the green has increased dramatically. So clearly what happened then was those national monuments got converted into national parks, which is an easier process for doing this. So Ford kind of set the ball in motion, I think, with this idea of doubling the parks. And he didn't achieve it himself directly, but I think he contributed then to the process. Okay, come to one final president. I think we're almost out of time, so we can do the real thing fairly quickly. Uh, he came in 1995 uh, up from Grand Teton National Park. 
and he gave a speech. He put a lot of emphasis on the democratic theme, talked about the economic benefits of Yellowstone as well, and, and then he was concerned with, became concerned with a mining operation uh, that was occurring just outside of Yellowstone that uh, threatened the park with a lot of pollution. So he enforced a moratorium on any further development. It was a gold mine, and, and so they had to stop production while they figured out what to do. And then over the next year, arranged a, a land swap where the federal government gave the company uh, then an equivalent parcel of land and took over that land for itself. So that Yellowstone was saved, in fact, under Clinton from this uh, potential catastrophe in terms of, of uh, mine pollution. So here we have him in 1996 making the announcement uh, about this, this step that he, that he took. post there, which we can skip through. So the question about that I'd like to raise is uh, why, did, why did these presidential visits have such a powerful effect overall, especially the ones where the presidents came and, and gave actual speeches? And there's a beautiful little letter written by uh, George Badgley, who was uh, in that photo with Ford at, at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And the, the other people there were former rangers who'd worked uh, with Ford when he had been a park ranger. So he had all these people come together and they had this wonderful luncheon and they reminisced. And Badgley, uh, the president sent a postcard back to Badgley uh, of, of the luncheon and then Badgley wrote back to the president in which he said, among other things, uh, this beautiful quotation, he said, in a park environment, people are more likely to be themselves. Self-confidence, vision, human insight, and an understanding of life's values come more easily into focus. And I think there's a lot of truth in this, that when these presidents came to Yellowstone, the park itself had a chance to kind of perform its magic on them and, and get them to think about something beyond uh, sort of everyday concerns. And, and so Badgley, I think, hit the nail on the head with this. And we find a little bit of confirmation of this uh, in my final little quotation. Uh, where Clinton himself said that uh, for a long time now, the American people have stood together to preserve our environment. After spending the last week in Wyoming, I have an even deeper commitment to fulfilling it. So he's acknowledging the fact that, that actually being there was important, and, and he decided he himself wanted then to do something quite significant. So the final thing I'd like to do very quickly is just thank a few people. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank Elizabeth Watry, who did a lot of uh, fantastic research for me in finding photos and, and finding that little, lovely little postcard from Roosevelt to his five-year-old son and all kinds of other great things. I'd like to thank people who sent me some emails and other photographs. Uh, but finally, and especially, I'd like to thank Mary Robinson for her invitation to give this talk today. And. Uh, I've agreed uh, quite happily that if anyone has any questions and we have about well, two minutes, I, I will answer as many of those as I possibly can. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, question. Um, I've read about four books about Theodore Roosevelt, and one suggested that his trip to Yellowstone was what. Um, what was what caused him um, to create almost 300 million acres of public lands, uh, not all national parks. Is, is that what you found out? In your yes, that's, that's true. Uh, it's because I'm trying to focus just on the speeches, of course, there's, there's a lot I have to kind of ignore, but that would have been in terms of the significance of that Yellowstone visit. It's, uh, I think it's partly this idea of the myth that he propagates, but uh, in a po very positive way, but then the concrete action he takes afterwards in terms of actual conservation uh, is very, very important. And uh, so thank you for that perceptive comment. That's, that's great. Yes, any other questions? Yes. Well, Roosevelt had uh, a great tool uh, in that he got Congress to pass the National Antiquities Act, which allowed him to do this. And with a stroke of a pen, he did things like create Grand Canyon National Park. Right. Uh, Bill Clinton used the same uh, uh, act to create the uh, Grand 
staircase uh, Escalante National Monument on the very last day of his administration. And I mean, just with us, Jimmy Carter created the Denali National Park with the stroke of a pen. Uh, National Antiquities Act, which Roosevelt got uh, put into place. Yes, so it's often, as that chart showed, it's often an indirect process. And the president can use, has certain powers and then can use them quite creatively. Uh, but in, in part, they also have to be inspired to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that if, they, if they simply stay in Washington, they're going to be less inspired than if they go out and visit some of these places. And I think the Yellowstone experience, I think, shows that clearly has, has been the case. We should pass a law making it mandatory that they come to Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> the first to Cody. <laughs> yes. That brings up a comment or an observation that we have in the McCracken a well-documented visit to Cody by Calvin Coolidge. I don't know if it coincided with his Yellowstone visit, but we should look at that while yes. we're here. Definitely needs to be researched. It like may not be the same year, but it might be. So, well, thank you very much. I don't think Elizabeth and I haven't discovered that one yet. Have you, or have you discovered it and haven't told me about it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 We're going to look into that for sure. Thank you for that. That's great. Anyone else have any other insights into what we should be looking at? Any questions you might have? Yes. I just had a good, uh, question about the, the woman who wrote about the cultural uh, history of Yellowstone. Yes, Judith Meyer. Literature and so forth, and had that, that interesting chart. I was interested in the religion, the religious association, and how it comes into the language. I was wondering what happens in the 60s and 70s when uh, things like nature becomes all of a sudden much more spiritual and, and, and much more personal. Uh, is, is that, did that I think your graph kind of dies at that point, but that's a really good point because it, I think if we carried it forward, we'd find that it, it probably starts to increase again. It's a little bit different in, in nature, but I think the the religious element would come back in with all sort of new age religions and so exactly. forth. Exactly. It wouldn't necessarily be God's sanctification of it, but it would. But it has the same kind of essence. Yes, but I thought it was interesting that in the because her book did not talk about speeches at all, but that, that uh, and, and way down on her list was the democratic theme, but for these speeches, I think the, the one theme that runs through almost all of them is, is the democratic nature of the park, and that plays into, for a politician, of course, that, that they can use that more effectively than some of the other themes. But for Harding, certainly, uh, the religious theme was very important, and, uh, if we'd had some visit, we didn't have any presidents coming in the 1960s, so we can't test it out. Uh, I don't think that, that Ford or Clinton played the religious angle too much, but uh, that's a good comment. I think generally, in terms of the literature, that would be worth investigating. Thank you. Okay, well, we're, we've hit our one o'clock.